Hi, I'm Pete Gerlach. Uh, I'm the author of the Break the Cycle nonprofit website that you may be looking at, or I hope you do. I want to present an idea to you today that may be uh, new to you, and it's important for you and your marriage and your family, if you're married. The subject is blocked or incomplete grief. You ever attended a lecture on that? Ever read a book about that? I've been a professional therapist for over 31 years, and what I've come to observe in many troubled individuals, couples, families, is that one of the stresses that they experience, and they're for the most part unaware of, is grief that has not been completed. The Break the Cycle website is composed of eight self-study lessons. They're sequential. The third lesson has to do with raising your awareness on what is good grief. What is healthy grief and how does it get blocked? And if you are suffering incomplete grief, what can you do to free it up? Grieving is nature's way of helping us adapt to inevitable broken bonds. A bond is created when we form a special emotional, psychological, mental attachment to something or someone. It can be physical, like a person, like a house, like a favorite location, like an object, a memento. It can be invisible. We can form bonds to our health, to our youth, to our freedom, to our integrity, to our looks. Um, we form attachments or strong preferences to things throughout our lives for reasons that are within our control or outside our control. Our bonds break. Death is the most common, uh, well-known kind of broken bond. When you lose a loved one, a child, a mate, a parent, a sibling, a mentor, there are many other equally powerful losses that we all experience throughout our lives, and very few people pay any attention to them. Our culture tends to demean and minimize losing and healthy grief. How can you tell if you have incomplete grief? The symptoms are similar to depression. One major symptom is chronic sadness. Another major symptom is chronic anger. Rageaholics often are suffering from incomplete or stuck grief. Another physical symptom that's pronounced in the American culture, perhaps elsewhere, is obesity. Many people feel, human service professionals feel, that people who are suffering grief and who lack permission to grieve in a healthy way comfort themselves by eating certain foods, high in fat, carbohydrates, comfort foods, um, obesity can be a sign, it's not proof, but it can be a sign that you may be suffering from incomplete grief of some major important loss earlier in your life. So depression, grief, chronic sadness, chronic anger, apathy, indifference, and not feeling interested in life, not knowing what you want to do or not much caring about your life. Sometimes suicide is a symptom of unfinished grief and some other things. So there are signs all around us that people may be experiencing and burdened with incomplete grief. Lesson three gives you more detail on how to determine if perhaps you or someone you care about, including children, are blocked in grieving important losses. 
If you conclude that you are blocked or someone you care about, what can be done? The good news is you can free up and complete healthy three-level grieving. By three-level, I mean mental, psychological, and for some people, spiritual. Grieving has three levels. Each level has several different phases. If you have blocked grief or incomplete grief, the very first step to take is study lesson one in this website, which costs nothing, it's free education, based on 31 years of research and clinical experience. Free your true self to guide you. If a false self guides you, it's much more likely that you will have trouble completing healthy grief and moving on with your life. So, work, study lesson one, learn to free your true self. The second thing you need to free up stuck grief is to learn about grieving. Our society doesn't teach us much about this, neither do our ancestors. Lesson three provides some fundamental information about bonding, losses, and grieving, the three levels and the phases of normal grief. So learn about healthy grief. One of the things you'll learn in this lesson is that a requisite for healthy grief can be called permissions. There are two kinds of permissions we all need in order to grieve well. The first starts within our skin. We need to have permission to go through the three levels of grief and reach the stage at the end of each level, which is called acceptance. If we are raised in a family, a low nurturance family, or the people that raise us are uncomfortable with strong emotions or with grief, they themselves don't know how to grieve, they don't tolerate kids who need to grieve, they don't guide kids and support kids who need to grieve, grieve. you may inherit uh, a, an anti-grieving policy, so to speak. That means you grow up with some values that say, I must keep a happy face even if I'm dying inside. Baloney. That's unhealthy. I can't burden other people with my pain. Baloney. Not true. Other people can take care of themselves as to how much pain they're willing to share with you. I can't talk about my unhappiness. Baloney. You have to talk about your pain and your losses over and over again until your story is told. So, you may have inherited an anti-grief policy from your childhood. If so, the thing to do is to find out what is your policy about grieving. Lesson 3 shows you how to do that. If you have an anti-grief policy, you can intentionally change it. You can adopt some new, healthier values about grieving. It's okay to cry. It's okay to get angry and feel outrage, even at God, uh, if you sustain a major loss that doesn't make sense at first. It's okay and healthy to grieve. It's okay to be around people who permit you to and encourage you to grieve. That's the second type of permission that we all need. We need to be among healthy people who accept that grieving is a normal part of healthy life and who encourage us and patiently support us as we grieve. If you're in a family, it's useful to check out what is your family's um, grief permission, your grief policy. Every family has a policy about grieving. Usually it's unspoken. It has to do with is grieving healthy? Do we support people who grieve? How do we support them? When do we support them? How do we know when people need support? So check out your family's grieving policy, especially if you are a parent, or you may be. 
What are you teaching your children about healthy grieving? Are you giving them a pro-grief, supportive grief environment? They're depending on you to do that. If you don't, they are apt to, at some point in their lives, be stuck in grieving and have these psychological and perhaps physical symptoms that are toxic. So, improve your inner grieving policy. Seek a supportive outer grieving policy. Another thing you can do to support yourself is go back over your life once you understand the concept of losses and broken bonds. Take an inventory of the major losses that you have sustained in your life. A universal example is loss of childhood innocence, loss of childhood freedom. We as young and mature adults have responsibilities that we never had as kids. That's a kind of loss. Loss of health, loss of vision, loss of the use of a limb, loss of jobs, loss of hope, loss of integrity, loss of a marriage, loss of a child. When your child leaves home, even under the best of circumstances, that causes some major losses. So go back across your life when you're not distracted, perhaps with people who know you and support you. Make a list of the major losses that you have encountered. Then examine each loss and see if you have grieved it well. Signs of not grieving well include uh, anniversary depression. Every August 4th, which is when my son died, I get real depressed. No, that is probably blocked grief. Um, being unwilling to talk about a loss can be a symptom. Being depressed at reminders of major losses, music, people, names, um, favorite mementos, holidays. There are many things that trigger sad feelings that can be, not always, but may be signs of unfinished grief. So go back, list your losses, and look compassionately at each one. Can I talk openly about this loss? Do I know what this loss meant to me? Often people don't stop to appreciate. This is what the loss of my longtime friend has meant to me. Take an inventory, check out whether you feel you've grieved each major loss in your life after you've decided what's your policy about grieving. <clears throat> if you have not grieved a particular loss, permit yourself, encourage yourself to go through the questions in the mental phase of grieving. Lesson 3 shows you what they are. And speak often to other compassionate people about your loss. Tell your story over and over again until you don't need to tell it anymore. The last thing that Lesson 3 urges you to do uh, in order to help break the cycle of psychological wounds and unawareness, the last thing is if you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, <clears throat> make it a point to teach the young people in your family about healthy grief and do everything you can to promote a pro-grief family. So, grieving can be blocked. When it is blocked, it can create major, serious, psychological and physiological problems. Black grief can, once you're aware of it, be freed up and completed. Lesson 3 out of the 8 in this website shows you how. I hope you will study Lesson 1 and 3. You need 1 to do 3. I hope you find it challenging, educational, useful. I hope it raises your awareness. I hope it helps you live a more productive, 
balanced 